Hi everybody, my name is Jaden. I'm Eli. I'm Jason. I'm Kaden. And we, we are, are the Yahoo uh, Notori Yahoo. YouTube channel. And we almost got that in sync. I think we'll leave this in there because we gave this a good try. Thank you very much everyone for joining us. It is a first day on our creator's calendar. It is a Sunday on the Babylonian calendar. And um, for those who are um, keeping Torah, this is the beginning of our week. And for those who are not keeping Torah, I guess you guys are going to go to a man-made church full of all sorts of unclean stuff and full of unclean doctrine. And we wish and we hope and we pray that you guys would not and that you would seek our creator where he is able to be found. And he is absolutely not found in a church made by man on a Sunday. All right, everybody. Um, how you guys doing? Good. Good. Okay, let us get into this. Okay, so we are into chapter 19 of this. And this is the first chapter that we have in this book of Khalid. That there is some stuff that is probably mistranslated. Um, it, it, goes not, it goes against a lot of what we know, but it could very well be something Messiah said. And so it's a little bit later down in this, and so it, it has brackets around it. And so when we get to it, we definitely want to study it and look at it and see what it is and see if we can figure this out. All right. Y'all ready? Yep. Okay. When Yahushua spent the days in Jerusalem, the nights were spent on the slopes of Mount Olive, and the disciples built shelters close to a place where there was an olive press or oil press. However, one day at eventide, Yahushua went to the house of Shimon, the pure, where some women who were followers of his were living. Though the disciples were given food, little was said to them, for they being strangers, the people in the house were suspicious, and Shimon lay on a cushion across from Yahushua. After they had eaten and were talking together, a woman came from a house nearby. She was veiled and carried an alabaster jar. Now this was Mary of Magdala, whose father had been a merchant, but he disowned her, for she had lived with a centurion serving in the army of Rome. When he returned to his lawful wife, Mary had kept herself by singing in the taverns of Galilee. All right, so we get a little bit more about um, Mary of Magdala. Yeah. Um, we knew she was at some level kind of a, uh, like a prostitute, uh, 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 that, um, but we, we didn't know that she lived with a centurion, um, anything like that. And we did not know that she was a, uh, tavern singer, um, which is, uh, you know, you guys probably wouldn't understand what that exactly is, but, um, that's one of those things that, uh, you know, you're, you're singing around, uh, the drunks, right? You're singing, um, you're hanging out with a lot of people who are there just to get sloshed and hammered. And so it's, it's a rough environment. And so, um, it, it just been very interesting, I suppose. Four, the woman unsealed the jar and poured a sweet scented oil over the head of Yahushua, seeing which some of those pres present were indigent saying, what a waste, what this could have been sold for a lot of money which would have benefited the poor. Yahushua said, leave her alone. There is little point in being angry with her when all she has done is to honor me. You can help the poor whenever you like, but I will not be here much longer. Turning to, to Mary of Magdala, he said, why do you pay me this honor? For the cost to you must have been great. Someone said, the price was easily obtained. Okay, um... Why do you think that somebody said that right out of the gate? Because this was a, a very expensive um, alabaster jar. Um, I remember um, in other texts that we hear, yeah, uh, it was like three hundred pieces of silver, wasn't it? Yeah, it was three. It was it was huge amounts of money. It was it was just a huge, um, huge cost. Why do you say? Why do you think somebody said the price was easily obtained? Uh, jealousy, anger. Yeah, you know, I think that was a, one of those slams, right? Because they knew who this woman was. And because of the way that they believe that um, prostitution is easy money, which it absolutely is not. But it was like a slam. It was a slam on this woman is what I believe that they were trying to do. Now, this is where we get into some funky stuff. And um, again, it's italicized and it's also in brackets, which is very, very good. And so that should be our first clue that there's something funny here. But let's read this and let's discuss this. Mary said to Yahushua, Sire, I am she who you saw in Panias. For when women reviled me, I came to you and said, Forgive my sins. When you asked whereon, wherein I had sinned, I said, By loving while unwed. Thereupon you said, That of itself is no wrongdoing and demonstrates greater love than that of many who say, The price of my love is marriage. 
You said I gave the greatest form of love any woman can give. For being virgin, I went to my love without the security of marriage, seeking in no way to bind the man. Yahushua said, With this man you did no wrong. And though your love was unblessed in the eyes of men, providing you loved truly, it was pure and sanctified in the sight of Elohim. The man, however, is not without sin in this manner and will surely be called a proper be called to a proper accounting. And though since leaving him you have done wrong, he bears his portion of the guilt. You chose freely not to t not to be a woman reserved for marriage, a choice you could rightly make. Only should you now seek marriage, saying, Though I love you too, now I have my price. Would you be doing wrong? This being committed against Elohim, love and your husband. All right. Um, what do you guys make of this? This sounds wrong, but I'll get it. But I mean, I think so, it sounds wrong. Let's let's discuss this. I think they committed fornication. She for, she did fornication. Now, the very first thing he said um, is that um, that she, by loving while unwed. Now, there's a difference between loving and fornication, right? It does You can love somebody without in being with them. But Messiah says this, and let's talk about this. He. But the, the question was loving while unwed. And he says that of itself is no wrongdoing and demonstrates greater love than that of many who say the price of my love is marriage. Okay. Um, there's something, I think there's something to be said there. I mean, I think there's something to be said, right? Because when you are married, when you are dedicated to your marriage, that, that's one thing. And um, for women in this age, in this world that they are in here, in, in, the, in the life of a Hebrew world, if they don't get married, they don't have security. They will not have a, a husband that is going to take care of them. And the only other option is if their parents are alive, then they'd be kicked out back to their parents. So um, does anyone have anything else on this? Kate, do you have any uh, words of wisdom here? Um, no, I don't understand it fully, the whole situation. Um, yeah, it, it's one of these things. And, and, and perhaps this is one of these things. Maybe we better spit the bones out and... Um, to keep the meat, uh, is, is being in a relationship without fornification evil? Oh, is well. loving somebody without being in that, is there a problem with loving somebody? No. Okay. Because I, I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of times you won't, you know, I guess in these kind of marriages, the, the whole, the whole world that we're in of, of dating isn't exactly biblical. There's, there's actually no, there's no such thing. You know, um, you, you didn't date. I mean, you went and you had a wife selected for you and, um, it was, it, it's like you would fall in love later. And, um, you, you see that, you see that with all the, the, our forefathers, you know, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a uh, all, all the way that they, they ended up with their wives, the way that, um, it came with them. It wasn't like they had a chance to fall in love. And so, the way that our creator, I guess, would prefer that we are married is in a fashion such as that. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't have a ton to say on this as well, other than um, it isn't very much parentheses. And, and I don't want anybody to hear what we're saying and go, well, um, I, I should go love somebody and I should go fornicate with them or something of the sort. And Messiah says this or that. That's not the way of the Torah. The Torah is not this at all. Right. You're 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 meant for it's a it's a one man, one woman kind of a thing um, in in he, in the Hebrew life, in the world of that multiple marriages are fine. And there's there's nothing, not multiple marriages, but multiple women within a man, man being the, the head of the house is what our creator has set up. Um, if you're outside of this, if you are in the dating scene which is something that is, is not, is not something that's holy. It's not something that's sanctified because usually what's going to happen is in the world that we are in is dating is going to lead to fornication. It's going to lead to becoming uncling. It's going to become, you know, you're going to ruin the chance that you have at your, um, purity. And so you should never, ever, ever put yourself in any kind of a situation ever that you will lose your purity. If, if that is where you are at. And, um, you know, I, I don't, as far as dating goes, I, I don't even, I don't think that I would even advise my kids right now, even at this point, my two kids are 19 years old. Um, they've never been on a date in their life. They've never held the hand of another woman. 
uh, or a woman, other than mom. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just, I, I wouldn't advise that you, uh, you go out there because I mean, to the world that we live in, it is just, it's one of those worlds that it's, nobody waits for marriage. Nobody waits for any kind of thing like this. And our creator will bring your spouse to you. Our creator will find that one that you're supposed to be with. And it's very clear when you do find them that, um, you will find that love and you will find that commitment. And so, um, please don't take anything out of this that would go against our creator's Torah because that would put Boss Clan in a lot of trouble for going um, against that. So, guys, please just be very careful that that particular part. Uh, verse 10. Mary said, Sire, I have been a sinner, but have not sinned this last year, nor shall I again. Should I love once more? I will now claim, I will now claim... I will not now claim the rights of marriage, which I once repudiated. Um, I don't know exactly what her question is Basically, on this. She wants to have a husband? She says, I will not now claim the rights of marriage, which I once repudiated. Um, I don't even know what the word repudiated means. Um, I'm pretty sure like hated or didn't want to do it tonight. Yeah, or something of that sort, right? And so um, Yahushua said, Love is a blending of spirits and not a union of flesh. Woe to those whose, whose love compounds discord in the place where love is fulfilled. If these things confound you, read the books of wisdom. Okay, now we, I believe that we have figured out what the books of wisdom are. And I do not believe, I believe that the Torah is in the books of wisdom or what you classify as books of wisdom. But um, we have a couple of books that are about wisdom. What books do we have, gentlemen? That we have, we have uh, Chakma, we have Proverbs, and... Uh Third one. Ecclesiasticus. Ecclesiasticus. Yeah, it's a rock. And so we have those, if you look at them, there's a tremendous amount of stuff in there about them. And uh, those are the books of wisdom that I believe. And if we took those to heart, that is what the books of wisdom, I believe, are. And if any of you guys out there actually know of that we are wrong on that or if the books of wisdom are something else, please let us know so we can discuss this as well. Okay, 12. During this time, those in positions of power were taking counsel as how they might take Yahushua by guile and deliver him to the Romans, for they feared a rising of the people during the great festival of the Yehudim. Now Yehuda of Iscariath, son of Shimon, who had followed Yosef, the just, before coming to Yahushua and becoming one of the twelve apostles, sought for the Messiah who would deliver the Yehudim. This is how, this is now believed to be another, not Yahushua. This he now believed to be another, not Yahushua, and he therefore sought to have Yahushua held during the festival. Yahuda, unlike the other apostles, was a Yahudium, therefore he was unrestricted. So right there, um, we hear that you know Judas was a Pharisee, right? This is why he was able to um, go to them where other people were not. So 14, Yahudi, Yahuda went to the council and said, my master performs signs and fulfills prophecies which speak to the hearts of the people. Therefore, might they not proclaim him in the coming days? The council said, the people are ripe for revolt and troublemakers are many. We will take this one also. Reveal him to us and we will hold him. And for the service, you will be paid in silver. One who sat in the council sent a warning to Yahushua saying, leave Bethany and go to Ephraim. But Yahushua returned a reply which said, things are as they should be and the prophecies will be fulfilled. Isn't Zacchaeus? Um, I like Zacchaeus sent that warning. I don't know. I don't know. So it, it's good that they, not everybody um, hated Messiah. Not, not everybody had, was trying not to... every Pharisee had a hand in killing him. Yeah, not every, not every Pharisee had a hand in killing him. Okay, 18. On the first day of the festival, when lambs were being sacrificed, the disciples came to Yahushua and asked where the Pesach meal should be eaten. Yahushua, Yahushua chose two of these and sent them away with this instruction. Go down and cross a stream flowing eastward from the city. At a place where there is a covered well, there you will see a man seated with a water pitcher beside him. Say to this man, We thirst, but need more than water. He will then arise, saying nothing, and you must follow him at a distance. And when you see him enter a house, go in also, give, giving this messenger message to the owner. We come from the master. He will then show you a room where you must make preparations. Now what do you guys make of this? Right uh, so this guy doesn't talk. Is that what he's got? This guy doesn't talk. I, I, this this means to me like a messenger, right? Like this is an, some sort of an angel or something or something of the sort. And um, his instructions are you must follow him at a distance. Like 
don't get too close to this guy. Um, but the guy says nothing. It's, it's kind of, I guess, kind of creepy. But you know, that is creepy. Yeah. Don't. So now, the house belonged to Obed, who was nigh four score years of age, so eighty years old, whose brother was Barnabas the Elder. In an upper room, the disciples prepared the Pesach meal. And when it was evening, Yahushua came with the 12 apostles and three others, but only 13 ate with them. So this is interesting because we finally get a guy's name who owns this house, right? The house belonged to Obed. Um, he was uh, nigh four score, so he's like really old. And um, his brother Barnabas. And so we, we never heard this stuff before. This is amazing that we get little details such as this. 21. After he had taken his place at the table and all were seated, Yahushua said, I have very much wanted to keep this pest off with you because it is the last before my ordeal. And I tell you, I will not share another with you until my purpose is fulfilled. Then he took the cup before him and drank, saying, Blood is the life of men. While this is the life of the great sacrificed for men, so it is a fitting and worthy symbol of he who offers his life for men. I will not taste wine again until the rule of Elohim is established. Now, this particular account, I think, is a better account than what we had, where um, he's like, this is my blood, drink of my blood, and, and, you know, people have taken that and are like, well, he's breaking Torah because he says he wants you to drink of the blood or eat of his flesh, and this makes a lot more sense, right, the understanding what this, this means. He then passed the cup to Yochanan, and taking the bread, he gave thanks and broke it, saying, this represents my body, which will be broken as an example to the sons and daughters of men, for all must freely sacrifice for others. As you eat of the bread, which is sacrifice, so shall you eat the bread of eternal life. For without sacrifice, there is no life. Henceforth, call it remembrance bread and remembrance wine. When meeting afterwards, do this and remember me. But remember also the sacrifices which must be made for the cause of Elohim. All right. I think we are going to end it at this right here. Um, this is one of these, this is a commandment, right? This is that Messiah gave us that when we are doing Passover like this, that there is a there is a, a, a bread and a wine and we are to do it in remembrance of the final meal. And that as we drink the wine, it is is the grapes. You know, it's, it's the same kind of thing that Messiah sacrificed for us the same life that the grapes had, the same life that Messiah had, and that, you know, his body is, is that bread. And so as we get into a feast time, we are actually getting into a, and not a feast time, but we're getting into, well, it is a feast time. We're getting into Sukkot and it, Shavuot, Shavuot excuse me. And we are, um, one of the things is we are, um, we're about a week later than I guess everybody else is doing it. And so we're going to do some lessons on that this week and get that out but we're definitely not doing it at the same time as everybody else is. And so um, we will get into that a little bit later, but all of these appointed times are extremely important for all of us as um, people of the kingdom, people of potential people of the kingdom, right? Because this is what our creator has wanted. This is what we are told to do. And this is how we, we are called as his people to do these appointed times and keep these appointed times. And these appointed times will be, um, leading in to a second exodus. These appointed times will 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 be, I mean, we're, on the day of blasting, more than likely, we, we may see a Messiah come one day. We, we have no idea, but we need to be ready and we need to be keeping these. These need to be on the front of our foreheads. We need to, to keep them and we need to understand them and, and apply them to our lives. And so, guys, hopefully you guys found something in this. Um, this one was a, a little different. This one, out of all the readings that we've done, this one is the only one that you got some eyebrows that you know are raised on this. And again, there's nothing in this that Messiah says fornication outside of marriage is good. He did not say that. And everybody in these 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 books have a different example. There's different there's different situations, and so. We are not Mary of Magdala and you are not Mary of Magdala. And so what applies right here to her, what Messiah says, do not apply that to you and, and live in fornication and live in that kind of stuff because that, that's not the way of the kingdom. And so guys, we hope you have a wonderful day. We love you guys very, very much and take care. All right. All right. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.